Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. This is my uh, third trip to Lebanon. And uh, in French, we say jamais de cent trois. In English, third is a charm. So I think this is nice to be here again among friends. Uh, I was given this topic, and um, I had to pretty much scramble a little bit about trying to see how I can present to a pulmonary audience something that we do as far as imaging. I think you already know about all the other biomarkers, but I think imaging, we're still struggling as far as how we can detect cancer at an early stage, and we know all the, all the problems. So what I'm gonna do is very briefly talk a, bit, a little bit about the background of, um, of um, the role of imaging in detection of early lung cancer. But also uh, what I want to do is share some of the uh, things that we do at the main campus. I'm still a um, uh, pr principal investigator in a large clinical trial, and what I want to do is just introduce you some of the things that we're doing over there. So that's where I'm gonna concentrate most of my talk. So I don't have to tell you about um, the background as far as the epidemiology of lung cancer, but even though we know that prostate cancer is more prevalent in men and breast cancer is more prevalent in women, the problem is that the, uh, the causes of death um, as far as uh, cancer-related death, we know that lung cancer does have the, um, the biggest burden in, in, in our population. And this is, those are the recent statistics from, uh, from the US. But I have to tell you that if you look at the world world, prevalence of uh, cancer-related mortality, lung cancer has become recently the number one cause of uh, um, uh, death cancers. And uh, right now we're thinking about around two million people now are dying every year from uh, uh, cancer, for lung cancer. So what, as, as a radiologist, what are our mot motivations? So we know that lung cancer is the most common cause of cancer-related death. Typically, lung cancer is diagnosed as stage four, and that it's still prevalent. Even though this slide is old, I don't think we have made major progress as far as changing those statistics. The average five-year survival rate for stage four is only 12%, and that's the problem because most of our people that come to us and present to us, either as a radiologist or pulmonologist, they come already at an advanced stage. However, we do know if we catch them at an early stage that the chance of survival is much higher. So for us, especially again as imager, the early detection of non-symptomatic stage with subsequent rhythm may dramatically increase our cure rate and survival rate. We do have multiple biomarkers that allow us to look at how we can detect uh, cancer at an early stage, but in imaging, I still have to emphasize that the chest X-ray still remains our most important tool, and we have to not neglect that tool because of some of the reasons I'm gonna mention a little later. But you know CT has been with us for over 30 years, and CT is definitely more sensitive in detecting early lung cancer, but can we use it as, as a screening tool? PET CT, obviously, you know, especially after the detection of lung cancer, can help us uh, try to identify the metabolism and the likelihood of a nodule being cancerous. And then, but more importantly now, we have some tools that we can add to those different modalities, whether chest X-ray, CT, or PET. So computer edit detection, volumetric dual energy, temporal subtraction, and even functional imaging, all those are some kind of post-processing software that allow you to hopefully detect cancers at an early stage. And then I don't have to go through the other ones, which are the blood biosignature, sputum. We are doing in our part of our uh, clinical trial, we're also doing breath analysis. As you may know now, we're looking at uh, biomarkers in the breath that can uh, allow us to detect early lung cancer. The problem, those are usually at the, at the subclinical level in the sense that you cannot detect them. So you have to be able to watch them, very, to watch those patients very, very, uh, uh, very closely. This is how typically the patient comes, right? Uh, you all pulmonologists will probably read the chest x-ray, but most of the, our cancer present at this stage. When you have a large necrotic lesion, you have adenopathy and you have metastasis. So this is your typical stage four. But as a radiologist, this is something that we have to be humble about, is the fact that if we go back two years before, the cancer was present. And you can see this should not have been missed. This is a 2.5 centimeter lesion, but obviously it was missed by a radiologist. And even going four years earlier, if you look closer, the lesion was present. So this is to stress the importance about how we have a tool, but that tool is not sensitive in the sense if it's not put in the right hands. So we do have tendency to miss those lesions. So in retrospect, we can detect most of those lesions. And again, I want to emphasize the fact that you don't need a CAT scan. You have to look at prior studies, and you have to be carefully analyze the chest X-ray, giving a patient a chance to detect the cancer at an earlier stage. Um, very briefly, just to give you a diagram about just the, um, um, the uh, what, um, the 
not necessarily the pathogenesis, but the progression of the lung cancer. So, and we know that lung cancer, by the way, is the most preventable cancer. 90% of lung cancers are directly related to cigarette smoking. So patients that are exposed to nicotine, you know, you have metaplasia of the epithelium lining, and then you start getting into carcinoma in situ. And then, of course, at that stage, and even at the early stage when it's not detected, there's always a risk of getting either lymphatic or hematogenous spread of disease. And the problem is that, obviously, then it will go into the uh, ipsilateral and control lymph nodes. And just realize that because of the size of the lesion, again, most of the time those lesions are going to be asymptomatic. So this is a dormant and silent cancer. And unless you have some tools to try to, uh, to, to, to detect those cancers at the patient that is at high risk, this is going to be basically missed and it's going to be silent until it becomes symptomatic when that it becomes too large as a chest x-ray that I showed you. But just again to demonstrate that the fact that those lesions can go to the contralateral lymph node and the ipsilateral lymph node, but typically the lung cancer will go to the different organs. And what it likes is the liver, the adrenal glands, the other side of the lung, and then lately you have the brain involvement and the bone involvement. Of course, there are different, uh, there, there are different penetrations, if you want, or predilection based on the cell type. And this is, this is one of the cancers that will present the typical squamous cell carcinoma that will be central. Now, this lesion, even though it's not very large, we're talking a three centimeter lesion, this being in the proximity of the bronchus, this will have tendency to give you symptoms. It may give you hemoptysis, it may give you cough. But the ones that typically we see are the peripheral lesions, the typical adenocarcinoma. And those obviously are away from major uh, uh, airways and major vessels, so those usually are silent. And uh, unfortunately, at this stage, this patient has already metastasis, but this is how the typical lung cancer present in the periphery. And again, very briefly as a diagram, if you look at the life of a cancer from the time when you have the very first cells to the time when you'll be able to detect it, there is the, the, the imager does play a role, but again, it's not until at a later stage that we can make an impact. So if you look at the carcinoma in situ, you know, you see it microscopically, but you don't see it on a specimen, obviously, and then the chest actually is going to be negative at that level. And of course, the CAT scan also is going to be negative. As you progress over time, and let's say during the first quarter of the life of the cancer, again, the cancer has grown, but again, it is still silent and it's not detected by chest x-ray. This is where some of the biomarkers then can be, can be present, uh, can, be, can be positive. So we're talking about the breath analysis and some of the blood bio biomarkers. But again, even if you suspect that there is a cancer, most of the time you're not gonna be able to see it. So you don't know where to go as far as to resect it, unless you elect to do something like a chemotherapy. But again, chemotherapy would be difficult if you don't know the exact cell type. So if you go through the three quarters of the life of the cancer, the chest x-ray is, now we're talking about two to three millimeter inside, the chest x-ray is still gonna be negative. The CAT scan is gonna be positive, but then this is the dilemma of finding this tiny nodule that is too small to characterize. It is indeterminate, but at least you know that there is something that doesn't belong there, and then you may elect to follow that, that lesion over time. And this is basically where we, as radiologists, we can make an impact is at the time when the, the nodule is around one centimeter in size. So the chest x-ray is gonna be positive, and you should be able to detect it, but as I told you, we have tendency to miss also those lesions. But you do a CAT scan, then you can see that the lesion is big enough where you can characterize it and then tell, well, this is most likely to be cancer because it does have some speculated margins. It does have the characteristics of a malignant behavior. But I just want to let you know there's always a risk of that lesion being, having metastasized and then where the prognosis is going to be relatively uh, uh, not very good. So if you look at the cancer growth, if you go from the first cell to the time when the patient has a 10 centimeter lesion, you're talking about 10 doubling times. And the doubling time depends obviously on the nature of, and the cell type, the nature of the lesion and the cell type. It can go as aggressive as 20 days of doubling time, but as slow as 400 days. And that's typically for the bronchoalveolar carcinoma for which they do have a good prognosis. So in general, uh, we, can, we can assume that the tumor is not detected 70% of its life. But just remember about also the last 25% of the life, that lesion may not have metastasis and we still can play a role and it still can be detected at that stage when I just want to emphasize that. So us as, 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 as radiologists, what are our challenges? One is detection. So be able to find that there is a tumor. Once you find it, 
or once you found a nodule, can you characterize it? And then obviously we have some few uh, tools that help us to characterize it. And of course, ultimately as a radiologist, you may call it to make a diagnosis based on the biopsy, either a transthoracic biopsy, CT guided or fluoroscopy guided. And again, just to go back again, what are the tools that we have available in our hands to be able to detect those cancers? And I want to emphasize that conventional uh, then radiography, especially conventional radiography as it moved to digital radiography, has allowed us to still make an impact on the early detection of lung cancer. But what has happened in the last 20 plus years is the fact that conventional radiography, even though it's widespread, now we have some added tools that we can make that, that, uh, that tool be enhanced and be able to detect uh, lung uh, early lung cancer. Tomography, that's, you know, if people in the audience just remember about linear tomography, obviously that has been given up four years ago when CAT scan came around, but now we have three-dimensional and a multi-dimensional computer tomography, and we have some added tools with computer tomography, volumetric measurement, um, uh, computer-aided detection, and now even computer-aided diagnosis. Um, molecular and functional imaging, so we're talking about PET and PET-CT, that allows us, once we detect the nodule, to see the characterization of this lesion may be metaboli being metabolically active and trying to differentiate it from, from benign pulmonary nodule. MRR really doesn't have any good role as far as the uh, evaluation of lung cancer, except for advanced lung cancer when you want to see if there is a chest wound invasion. And definitely we don't use MRI as a screening tool. So it's still the, 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 the screening tools that we would like to use and what's the value are still, going to, are still very debatable. I just want to tell you that the last thing that came out at the National Lung uh, Screening Trial, that's the one that last year did give us some promises and some results. And this was about 53,000 high-risk patients that are former smokers or active smokers. And they were randomized to chest CT and chest CT versus screening. The problem is that the advantage that we found that there is a good, it, it does have a value, it can make an impact on early detection of lung cancer. The problem with that is obviously the, 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 the side effects, which is one is the, the too many false positive and how do you do and how do you manage the false positive. Uh, the other one obviously is the cost of doing a CAT scan. The other thing is the availability, and then the last thing is the fact that there is radiation associated with that, even though using low-dose radiation. Also, when you do CAT scan, the problem with the CAT scan, you're going to detect more nodules that you can see on the chest x-ray. And what do you do with those nodules? Even though that you know from an endemic area, you're going to find a lot of nodules, they, most of them are going to be benign. But once you find it, and as a, as a radiologist, then you're compelled to follow those, those lesions and to make sure that this, they're not going to turn out to be a, as a cancer. Cancer has to start somewhere, and when they're very small, you cannot differentiate them from benign pulmonary nodules. And if you look at the multiple studies that have, um, that have engaged into the screening trials, looking at either CT, with chest x-ray, or without chest x-ray, you can see that there is a wide range of uh, percentage of nodules detected, up to 50% in certain trials, but then also, <coughs> excuse me, the range of the percentage of lung cancer that detected in those trials. And again, so the debate is still going on as far as whether a CT scan is a useful tool for the screening of detection of, uh, screening and early detection of lung cancer. Um, I'm just going to pass into those, but basically what you need, what, what you realize when you have a nodule is that you do, once you find them, you have to have some intensive imaging protocols. So you, you may end up doing bronchoscopy in the larger lesions, and then, of course, then you have the follow-up, the radiation associated with the follow-up, and the anxiety that is, um, that is uh, um, uh, associated with that. I want to take you back just to the fact that lung cancer can be detected in a chest x-ray, and chest x-ray is, in most of the departments, chest x-rays in the imaging department make up 50% of all the volume of imaging, meaning that it is a very commonly uh, obtained procedure. It is a, it's a relatively inexpensive, it's minimal radiation. The problem with that is that there is a wide disparity as far as the interpretation of the chest x-ray. And if, you, if, if you're an expert on reading chest x-rays, you may have tendency to detect those early lung cancer. But if you're not an expert, then there is a risk of missing lung cancer. In the United States, used to be the most common cause of litigation is having missed a lung cancer on chest x-ray. At all medical litigation, not just in radiology. Now it's the second most common because breast cancer and missing breast cancer on mammography has become now the number one cause of litigation. Um, and 90% of all those litigation obviously are due to the fact that they missed on chest x-ray. But also we do have some cases of litigation where the, cats, where the cancer is missed on a on on cat scan. 
And very briefly, what are the factors that uh, contribute to the fact that we miss lung cancer? Um, most of it is due to lesion characteristics. So a small lesion, a very faint lesion, and the fact that it's not a very solid lesion may have tendency to have the lesion very, very inconspicuous and, and easy to miss. And then, of course, you have the observer error. So it's you as a radiologist or a pulmonologist looking at chest x-ray and missing the lesion, and there are multiple causes and reasons why we miss the, miss the lesion. And then the other thing is you don't have an optimum image. So technical factors, underpenetrated, um, rotated, all those kind of things may, have, may make you miss, miss a, a certain lesion. But again, just as far as the lesion characteristics, you have the size, and then you have the density. But more importantly is that the chest x-ray is a two-dimensional, uh, uh, if you want, uh, medium, where you're trying to portray a three-dimensional structure. So you have a lot of overlap of ribs, clavicles, scapula, and all that that can obscure such, such a lesion. So if you look at the multiple studies that have been done, up to 90% of lung cancers when they've seen, if you go back and the patient had prior chest x-rays, they were there. And obviously they were there as a smaller stage and at, at, at the lower stage and a smaller size. So what we think about CAD, this software that you may apply, the computer edit detection, is that can you use CAD as an extra tool, as an ex extra pair of eyes to try to direct you to an area that could represent potentially cancer that you may have tendency to, to miss? And that's what I'm going to try to emphasize for the rest of, the, of, my, of my lecture. So just to go back as far as comparing CT versus X-ray, so CT is more sensitive, but many more indeterminate nodules typically benign nodules are detected. It does have higher radiation exposure, higher cost, and not as available and accessible. So what we think is that if we can add CAD to chest X-ray, can we raise the sensitivity of the chest X-ray almost as, as close to the level of the CAT scan without having the other uh, negative things that the CAT scan bring? Again, the too many false positives and the fact that it's uh, higher radiation and so on. So fewer small benign, uh, benign nodules are going to be identified in the chest X-ray. And obviously, it's a lower cost, greater availability, and lower radiation exposure. And this is just to show you that we did a study to look at that as CAD has come along in the last few years. So how, what's the impact of CAD? Can it make us better radiologists or pulmonologists in detecting cancer using the chest x-ray? So we try to evaluate first, before we did the study, the study, we have to look at the different CAD products that are available to us and see what's the performance of those CAD. How good are they in detecting lung cancer? So we have to test them against known patients or known x-rays with cancer. But once we have the CAD, then who's going to use the CAD is obviously the interpreter. So how good are the interpreter in using CAD, meaning when do they accept their, 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 their region of interest, their marking, and I'm going to show you that. And then once we have done all of those, then the goal is that to see in a clinical trial, in a prospective randomized clinical trial, to see really did it make a difference in the long run in mortality and, and morbidity of the patient, looking at quality of life, but did it make any difference? Uh, we're using CAD or we're using CAT scan, but in five years, 10, 10 years down the road, did it make a difference as far as the uh, detection of lung cancer, but also the survival rate? So looking at the performance, what we did is, and there are only very few, uh, I'm not here to promote this particular product, but we worked with them to try to develop different generation of those computer aid detection product. And this is from one company that we tested four different generation of CAD products. And what we did is we, we submitted those, uh, those CAD products to 100 patients with 100 actionable nodules. We say actionable, but those are all lung cancers. But we try to reproduce, reproduce something that really happens in life into normal clinical practice. So we, we were sure that we don't have a very large lung cancer that are obvious, and we were ensure that also they're not also that many very subtle cancer. But we want to test the product in all different spectrum of those pulmonary nodules. And this is just to tell you the size, the median size being basically the one, around the 1.5 uh, centimeters, and that's the typical type of cancer that we present to us in the clinical practice. And this is just a distribution, and also in this, in, in, our, in, our, uh, um, uh, in our sample, we did find that actually it does reproduce the same kind of distribution as you find in the general population when you have more cancers to the APCs and more cancers to the right compared to the left. And this is a typical cancer. You, everybody is going to be able to detect this lung cancer, but we want to see how the different CAT products and versions did, the, did the, uh, test this, this, this cancer. And so you can see that the patient 
has, the CAD has circled the area of interest, but at the same time has circled all those areas which we call false positive. And that can be a problem because this is then the distraction. But at least it has brought your attention to, to this lesion. And again, this is just a case of an obvious lesion. But as you have evolved with a different generation, that was 1.1, this is the 3.0 version, then you have less false positive, we make sure that it still detects that cancer. Version four, uh, uh, version 4 has actually more false positive, and this is the latest version for which you have a true 100% accuracy where you only detect the lung cancer, you don't have false positive and you don't have false negative. And then with, with, with the, if you look at the sensitivity versus the number of false positive per patient, you can see that you moved from this version here that has a low sensitivity but also too many false positive to the latest one that has a higher sensitivity and fewer false positive per image. So once we, have the, once we have tested the product, also we wanted to test the users. And so what we had to do is to have 18 readers and a cross-section of the people, who are the people that read chest x-rays. So typically in the US, you have, chest, uh, you have chest radiologists, so that's all they do and they're experts. And then you have general radiologists, which actually is the majority of our radiologists in the US. But also we have tested also six pulmonologists. And uh, how many pulmonologists are here? Okay, and how many radiologists? Okay, so the majority is pulmonologists. So I'm not here to put down the pulmonologists, but I just want to share some of the results that we have with, the, with all these cross-section uh, specialties that are using the, 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 the chest x-ray. And then what we did also, we want to make sure that we have a spectrum of difficult lesions and non-difficult lesions. So we had a very good, uh, 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 I guess, balance between the very subtle lesion, the moderate subtle lesion, and the obvious lesion. So this is a very important group of nodules here because the obvious lesion, everybody's gonna see the obvious lesion, even CAD, and CAD is not gonna make that much difference in your interpretation. The very subtle lesions are gonna be very, very subtle, and even CAD is not gonna perform well, and it's okay if you don't perform well. And this is the cases for which you're not gonna to go to court with. You're gonna to go to court because of this, the moderately subtle lesion, where they're gonna say, well, based on, the, on, the, on your expertise, you should have been able to detect those lesions. And this is where we want to really make sure that CAD has made an impact, is on the moderately subtle lesion. So the lesions that can be less than one centimeter and can be faint and can be not as radio opaque and easily to miss. So here's a case for which out of the 18 readers, you have four people that missed it. It's not that they missed it because they didn't see it. They missed it by the fact that they said, well, there is something there, but it's not a cancer. Do you see it? Right, it's obvious, this patient with pulmonary emphysema. And here it is, it's, it's, a, it's an eight millimeter lesion. And you look at the CAT scan and the lesion is obviously there and it's speculated and this is a cancer. And you can see the pulmonary emphysema and the CAT did the good, the good job, but also obviously it, it marked those four positive that are based on the rib. Now, 18 people missed this 2.5 centimeter, two centimeter lesion. Can, everybody, can anybody tell me where the lesion is? Go ahead. Okay. Now, Kat showed it. Uh, now, out of those four, uh, five markers, there is one that is positive and the other ones are false positive. Do you see it now? Anybody? Overlying the hilum. <laughs> and here it is, look how big it is. But CAD has a, and it's interesting because now some readers, even though CAD pointed that, they ignored it. How about here? 14 people missed the lesion. See it, no? Now CAD is showing it, now only three false positives. Same location, smaller lesion. Here it is. Now, CAD didn't detect it, but can you detect it? 15 people missed it, but three people found it. Hard to see. And again, because of its density and its location, another CAD also missed it. Here it is. It's a very small lesion. But in court, you're going to be sued for missing some such a lesion. They say, well, it's there. You should have been able to see it. And this was stage one, extensive emphysema, and this could have made a difference for the patient. 16 people missed this lesion. I have to say that uh, I saw it, but I debated it, and then I ignored it, but actually it's there. And this is a very difficult lesion, too, because of its location. Very faint, because superimposed on the rib. And here it is, very small lesion, but this is already a one-centimeter lesion. 
And this one, I biopsied this lesion. I was surprised that 18 people missed it. This is a two centimeter lesion. Can you see it? Here's the aortic arch. It stops here. This is not the aortic arch. This is a tumor just sitting on the top of the aortic arch. And here it is. So readers are most likely to miss small lesions in the apex, and we know that, and you have to, you know, when you learn how to read a chest x-ray, you have to go to the hidden areas, and the apex is definitely one of the hidden areas. Expert not as affected by size and location. General is not as affected by location. And the pulmonologists were affected by small size, low density, and lesion location. So all those factors did influence the pulmonologist readings. Expert and general radiologists have a lower number of false positive, and CAD false positive did not affect them, so they were able to make the right decision. Pulmonologists have a high number of false positive, but at the same time, because they don't see chest x-rays every day, and so they, everything that looks like fibrosis can potentially look like, like, like a cancer. And then false positive, when using CAD version, they actually they accept a lot of false positive from the CAD version. So I guess they, they need some kind of training for those people. Now, one thing that I want to say is the potential sensitivity. CAD has marked certain lesion, but it was ignored by the different group of readers. But you can see that even with expert readers, you could have improved your sensitivity in detecting cancer if you accepted the CAD, the CAD markings, and especially with the general radiologist and with the, and with the pulmonologist. So it has the potential, so rapid screen and even the other versions have the potential to increase your direct sensitivities. And what's important is, again, with this moderately subtle lesion, this is where you really need to make an impact, and this is where CAD did make a difference. And again, it has a low, um, low uh, performance on the, so CAD did not affect low performance in subtle lesions and the high performance in it. But all readers could, should improve when CAD was used to detect moderate subtle lesion. And that's what we learned from testing those different CAD products. So expertise, especially training and experience volume, may affect readers' accuracy. The use of CAD did not show a statistically significant improvement in the performance, but it could have potentially improved the sensitivity if they accepted the, 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 the marking. And the readers need to learn to be accustomed on how to use CAD efficiently. I'm going to very quickly um, move uh, further about the fact that we do have now still some versions that have too many false positives, and it can be a distraction from the true cancer. And the same thing here, too many false positives, and then it missed a lung cancer. But this is what we want to CAD. CAD, you want CAD to be 100% accurate by just detecting the lesion itself and no false positive. And the same thing with this one here. So one thing that since then what we did is also we want to make sure that now there is a scale down marker so it can just show the area of interest, not a big circle for which you may have a lesion that is at the edge of the circle. And this is the, uh, the results from the clinical trial that we're doing right now, the 8,000 people. And this is one example for which CAD did make a difference, which was originally missed. And you can see that there is a cancer here, and this is where the cancer. So we, so far, out of the 1,500 patients, we have six cancers that were detected with a CAD, with a CAD product. I want to tell you that's one, one more uh, product that's now available that is even better that CAD, by the fact that now you can have that associated with CAD, is what we call soft view. So SoftView is a product that removes the rib. And if I go back, no, that's all right. If I go to this one here, how can I go back? Yeah. So this is with the rib, and this is without the rib now. You see how the lesion is more obvious now without the rib? And this is to duplicate this very expensive uh, modality, which is dual energy, for which you can remove the ribs or we can enhance the, uh, the, the bony structures. But this is what, when you remove the rib, then you can see the lesions better. But then, as out of a, instead of having a $2 million piece of equipment with more radiation, you can have a $20,000 software program that can actually suppress the ribs. Can you see the tumor? Anybody? Left. How about now, can you see it? How about now, can you see it? Left or right? Left, right? But look how much better it is when you remove the ribs. Can you see the lesion? This is a, um, a, uh, a radiologist. Um, this is uh, 20 years ago presenting with hematosis, emphysema. Again, just look at the APCs. That's the most common areas where we have tendency to miss the lesion. You see there's an added density here compared to here. Barely seen on the, on the, on the lateral view. And this is a big tumor that already had metastasis. 
And I'm just, I've finished, I've showed this many times before. Now, you don't need all that fancy stuff. You can, can you tell this is a cancer or pneumonia? Yes. Cancer, right? You see the pack of cigarette? The cause. The pack of cigarette, and even the lighter. And the last cigarette was taken here, and you have directly the cause. You don't need anything fancy, but you still be able to detect those things here. So I'm gonna just quit, finish here, but just to let you know, we can do all of those things, but prevention is gonna be the most important thing. And cigarette smoking, if we can, do some preventive measures, cigarette smoking, it's gonna go a long way rather than having the cancer and having to deal with it. And as cigarette consumption has decreased in the, in the US, it has gone rampant all over the world and now we're gonna have a, a pandemic as far as lung cancer. So I'm gonna just stop there. I'm sorry I took a couple of minutes over my time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting lecture.